World Cup qualifying is over, like kind of, almost, but I mean, the draw just freaking happened. World Cup qualifying is done. The last window had some crazy drama from CONCACAF to Africa, which was literally insane. Asia even had a ridiculous final day that produced a result I completely didn't expect, but the most important takeaway is the United States is back in the World Cup. Fire the cannons, baby! Yeah! Yeah, brother! Yeah! Bald Eagles! Tea in the harbor! Give me a burger and a hot dog! How dang it, we're going to the World Cup! But seriously, what happened? We'll start with CONCACAF, that is the North, Central America, and the Caribbean. Nice, fun continent. And there were three matches. This was a crazy qualifying setup that CONCACAF had. Every international window, we were playing three matches in a week, which is madness. So three more matches and a lot of crazy stuff could have happened. We start with round 12. Now, there were five teams that were basically still involved at this point out of an eight-team group. You've got Canada. They were basically already in. Mexico and the United States played each other in the first match day. They were both nervous. Then you had Panama, and then you had Costa Rica, which had become relevant after a huge performance from them over the last international window. And that huge performance would continue because Costa Rica beat Canada one to nothing. A massive result that allowed Costa Rica to put serious pressure on Panama because Panama choked it against Honduras. Panama had the lead in the first half, gave up a 65th minute goal to an Honduran team that didn't have a point in like five matches. A brutal result for Panama at home with a return to the World Cup on tap. They'd only ever been to one World Cup ever, and it was in 2018. For Costa Rica, the hero was 33-year-old from Alajuelense, which is a local club in Costa Rica, Celso Borges. He's the man that scored the goal to give them the three points against Canada. That result would start a nine-point window for Costa Rica that saw them go from, well, they need a lot of help and they have to play Canada and the United States, to, oh my goodness, we almost qualified for the World Cup without having to go to the Intercontinental Playoff. The U.S. and Mexico in a match that in ended up being incredibly important, battled out a nil-nil draw, whereas an American fan, I feel like we left two points on the table. There were two amazing chances, one in each half to score goals. We missed them both. Match day 13 saw the U.S. basically clinch World Cup qualification against Panama. We got Panama at home, played in front of a raucous crowd in Orlando. Pulisic had a hat trick, including a sick third goal that I obviously can't show you videos of, but here's a picture. I would recommend watching it. It's fantastic. And not only did the United States put itself three points clear, clear of what would end up being Costa Rica because they beat El Salvador two to one. We had such a giant goal difference advantage that it essentially meant that that result clenched our World Cup qualification and that result provided a monstrous sigh of relief for me. For Mexico, they got their sigh of relief as well. It wasn't necessarily as emphatic, but a 70th minute goal from Edson Alvarez of Ajax did give them the win against a suddenly very decent Honduran team. So Mexico is also three points clear of Costa Rica going into the final match day. Panama with these results went from being in the driver's seat to officially eliminate it. That's how important the equalizer from Honduras was. If Panama had picked up those extra two points, even with this defeat, they would have been relevant going into the final match day. They went from in playoff position to completely out in the first two matches. Canada officially cinched what we long knew was going to happen, that they were going to qualify for the World Cup, a 4-0 drubbing of the reggae boys of Jamaica. The final match day would get a little weird. So Panama actually went and beat Canada. The winners of the entire, I think we call it the octagonal now, lost two of their last three matches after winning six straight. So those from the Great White North did win the qualifying table, but barely. Panama will be kicking themselves that they didn't get a better result against Honduras. Mexico and the United States just needed to avoid a loss to not be nervous. Mexico beat El Salvador two to nothing, so they were fine. The United States lost at Costa Rica two to nothing, which is a good time to raise the point that the United States has actually never won in San Jose, Costa Rica. It's the capital ever, literally ever. The last time we played there, we lost four to nothing. So this is technically an improvement. Costa Rica is very hard to break down and they were very hard to beat in San Jose again. Taylor Navas came off with a knock. We'll see if that's relevant for the playoff in June, but Costa Rica clinched the playoff spot in June. This is what the final table looked like. Canada on goal difference finishing top of that table. Mexico and the United States going through. The U.S. going through on goal difference because Costa Rica won its last four matches and got 13 points from its last five in qualifying to fire by the Canal Boys, Los Canaleros of Panama. A huge drop off to Jamaica, El Salvador, and Honduras, but an interesting five-team race to the end. Hello.
Since you're already here for a World Cup qualifying video, that means you like learning about things, which is why our sponsor today is fantastic. It's Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands and thousands of classes about your passion or to help you find a new passion on an easy to use platform. So for me, my passion is obviously YouTube. They gave me a free month to try out some classes and I found a great YouTube video making. <laughs> Clearly it wasn't good enough to teach me to not hit my microphone, but I found a great class by Marcus Brownlee that did make me a better YouTuber. It helped me come up with a couple of video ideas I wouldn't have come up with otherwise, like this one, where we made Burnley's players tall. It makes sense, it's YouTube. But it's not just for these passions, it's what do you want to know more about? There's probably a class for it, the Absolute Beginner's Guide to Information Security with Alexander Oni. That's there. If you feel like you're not secure enough with your information, Skillshare's got you. And if you want to have the same experience I did and just dive in and try it out, the first 1,000 people that click the link in the description or use code Zealand will be able to try Skillshare entirely free for a month. So you should probably move quickly to go click the link, really. So start exploring your creativity today. Click that link in the description and get Skillshare for free for a month if you have the agility to be in the first 1,000. Now back to your other passion. World Cup qualifying. This brings us to Africa, which I found to be the most entertaining. I mean, I mean, my own country was qualifying for the World Cup after missing four years ago. I found this to be the most interesting continent of the whole round. So what Africa does, they have 10 groups. You have to win your group. And if you win your group, then you get drawn into a home and away against another team that won their group. And you have to win that to go to the World Cup. Africa is insanely difficult to qualify out of because a lot of the teams you'll see expect to make the World Cup. And obviously not all of them can. There was a seeding mechanic. The top five teams uh, that won their group in world ranking were the seeded teams. They got to play the home match in the second leg, which is always important. If you have extra time penalties, it's at home. Then you had the five unseeded teams, teams like Mali, teams like DR Congo that were a little lower in the world ranking, but won their group. And so here they are. The first round of matches was incredibly interesting, but also gave us essentially nothing. It pushed all the drama back to the second leg. Egypt hosted Senegal and won one to nothing. A bit of revenge after those two teams met in the Africa. A Cup of Nations final, which Senegal won on penalties, Mo Salah in the mud. Ghana and Nigeria played their first leg in Ghana. Ghana actually put out a pretty decent showing compared to the fact that they'd been terrible in the group qualifying and just eat their way by South Africa to get here. That nil-nil ended up looking pretty good. Cameroon played at home against Algeria and lost, which is very tough because home advantage in Africa is significant for reasons we will cover momentarily, but have to do with a laser show on a dance floor. It'll all make sense in a second. The Algerian goal coming from the big bold beauty Slimani. Then Mali played at home against Tunisia. The Tunisia national team scored the all important goal on the road. And then four minutes later, the man that scored the own goal, Sasako, was given a red card. And so that basically washed out the rest of the entire game and the rest of the tie. I'm just gonna give this to you now. Tunisia essentially set up the bus for 180 minutes, didn't give up a goal at home, drew nil-nil, and is going to the World Cup on an own goal. Sometimes you can't make this stuff up, but at the same time, Tunisia is not the most talented team in Africa. They got a pretty fortunate draw. Mali would never been to a World Cup, but Mali has a lot of talent, a lot more talent than you would think. I and mean, if you watch the Tunisia-Mali game, Mali was the team that seemed to have the more quality, but Tunisia had the experience, the physicality, the organization. I mean, look at the size of these lads, the beards, the tight, the, the tight shirts. They had a great look going. They set it up for 180 minutes, scored an own goal on the road, and they're going to the World Cup because of it. That was it. The final match of the first round was Congo and Morocco. The DR Congo scored in the 12th minute. They've got to be feeling themselves. They haven't been to the World Cup since like 1972 when they were called Zaire. And then Morocco misses a penalty, but finally Tisudali scores in the 76th minute. So Morocco has the away goal going to the home leg. That means the DR Congo has to score. And that ended up costing the Democratic Republic of the Congo because they had to come out of their shell. And as they did that, Unahi scored in the 21st minute. Tisudali scored again right before halftime. It was you know, three to one on aggregate at that point. Morocco scores two more goals before the 70th minute, including Ashraf Hakimi to put the bow on it. And DR Congo, a team that didn't even make the Africa Cup of Nations, even though they're better than that, they still were the easiest team to beat in this entire round, falls to Morocco. They needed a miraculous road win that was not coming. So we got Tunisia and Morocco through. What about the other three? Well, then there's Nigeria and Ghana. Now, Nigeria is better than Ghana. I think everybody would acknowledge that. Nigeria has more talent 
at almost every position. They've made every World Cup since 2006 and are just considered the giants of Africa in a lot of ways. Ghana's on a huge downward turn from those Ghanaian teams that were making it into World Cup quarterfinals. They missed the last World Cup. They were bad at the Africa Cup of Nations. But they did get a goal, and it was because of an awful mistake by Uzou, the goalkeeper for Nigeria who plays in the Cypriot League, and I'm not going to badmouth the Cypriot League, but most of you might have not even known Cyprus had a competitive league with a Nigerian goalkeeper in it. I rest my case. He misses the save, Ghana gets an away goal, and then advances to the World Cup on away goals because Nigeria got one goal back, and that was it. The fans then rushed the field after the game, trying to chase down the players, and I, uh, who knows what they actually wanted to do. Fortunately, the players got off the field in time, but that's the insanity that was going on in Africa qualifying day. And it somehow does not match the insanity of the final two matches, where we had Senegal beating Egypt once again in a penalty shootout. Now, I must be completely clear here. Senegal was the much better team. And when I say the better team, the team that looked much more likely to score. Obviously, you're the better team if you win. And that's an argument that you can more you can make with me in the comments, but I will agree with you. Senegal was the progressive team, the team that looked like they had the chances to win. And Egypt just didn't have as much quality as Senegal throughout the entire process. Senegal literally scored in the third minute and then was just sieging the goal the rest of the game. Egypt had, I think, two really good chances on the counterattack. They missed them both. And then we got to a penalty shootout that could only be described as something inside of a German club at three in the morning. <laughs> and it's Mohamed Salah. <laughs> and he missed. So the Senegalese may or may not have brought a few lasers into the stands. By the Senegalese, I mean the Senegal fans. It was a great atmosphere. I watched most of the game. Uh, I turned it on right after I finished a stream. And my goodness, it was a bumper crowd, brand new stadium, first competitive match in the stadium in Dakar. And the first four penalties were missed, but the laser light show eventually did its job. Senegal sank a couple of penalties. Sadio Mane scored the penalty to win the AFCON, scored the penalty to send Senegal to its third ever World Cup. That's a pretty good year. But Egypt out and then for simply the craziest way to go to the World Cup that anybody's ever seen, Algeria and Cameroon. And I am fortunate to say that I watched this live because I still don't believe that it happened. Now, if you remember, Algeria won one to nothing on the road. That means they don't only just have a one goal lead, they have an away goal to bring home as well which means if Algeria scores, then Cameroon needs to score at least two. Cameroon got things going pretty well in the first half. They scored with Chupo Moting, their star striker in the 22nd minute, tucking the ball home. And this is a tough place to play. Now, granted, if we're looking at the stadium here, the fans are about 45 miles away from the actual field, but that was good because later in the game, it gave them a lot of room to throw bottles without them actually getting on the field. So, you know, like upside. Point being, it's an absolutely crazy crowd. And then Algeria starts to feel very hard done. They get one goal disallowed for offside. And then because it's one nothing Cameroon, that's one away goal and a 1-1 scoreline overall, we go to extra time, they score again. And it's the bald beauty Slimani, and he's like running all over the place. He's the guy that had the goal disallowed in the first half. He's back again. He's running off like this towards the fans. They're celebrating 98th minute. They called off for handball. He's got his arm on the shoulder of the defender. And instead of the ball hitting him in the head or the shoulder, it goes off his arm and like his hand, his wrist really, and goes into the goal. And so it is a handball. But after all of this, the two disallowed goals, all this craziness, Algeria scores. It's a corner and there's just some dude wide open just past the penalty spot on the far post. And he heads it straight into the back of the net. Nothing Onana can do. 118th minute, Algeria is going to the World Cup. Like it's over. And by I mean it's over, they're at home. So they have the ability to waste time that's insane. Like here's an example. They scored the goal with 117 minutes gone in 20 seconds. They then <laughs> celebrate for a minute and a half, which totally fair makes complete sense then Slomani the bald beauty is walking back for the celebration and cramps up right and he gets a nasty cramp and he's laying right in the middle of the field dry heaving and instead of bringing the stretcher on some dude just with a golf cart and he's sitting on the field with the golf cart they get Slomani in a stretcher put him on the golf cart kind of saunter off they don't kick the ball until four minutes after the goal has been scored insanity I'm sitting over here like well, this is just some all time, time wasting to try and basically get to the end of the game. They then give four minutes of stoppage time, which as we've just discussed, fair. And in the fourth minute of those four minutes of stoppage time, of which of course, one minute was already taken off of Slimani being, you know, whisked away on a golf cart, Cameron scores and away goals factor in an extra time. And so it's just 
like over because the score on aggregate is 2-2, but Cameroon has two away goals. It is inexplicable. It's a short throw from the near side of the field. It gets knocked down, crossed by Collins Fi. It's headed down, and Toko Akambe is held onside by some guy who will never live the fact that he's holding Toko Akambe onside down. And he just hits it into the back of the net. It looks way too easy. And Algeria went from collective elation to disbelief. The coach for Algeria didn't get off the ground for the 10 minutes of post-match coverage we got in the United States. It was a spectacular sporting moment in terms of the highs and the lows, because Algeria went from elation, 118th minute goal to go to the World Cup's crazy enough, conceding 123 third minute goal 124th minute goal to not go to the world cup and for cameroon you can't even imagine the scenes of watching that ball go in you're looking for onside a foul nothing it was very onside everything clean balls in the net game over they kicked it off and the whistle blew in 10 seconds rightfully so i mean it was the last play of the game and it was one of the craziest things i've ever seen and that's how cameroon got to the world cup against all odds and now algeria a team that is capable of making the knockout stages missed out entirely and the next team to qualify for the world cup was the subscribe button always world-class and always appreciated. But to Asia, where there was just a little bit of drama left, because if you look at the groups, there was a pretty good distinction between Saudi Arabia and Australia. Australia went out and lost to Japan and lost to Saudi Arabia, so they were very clearly put into the playoff. Actually only finished a point ahead of Oman, who showed up and won their last two games just to make people believe. They beat China and Vietnam, so it was a real shame that they couldn't have put more pressure on Australia down the stretch. The real drama was Iraq in the United Arab Emirates and technically Lebanon going into the last two matches because that's how you could get into the, in the Asian playoff, where you play the other third place team from the other table, then you, you win that, you go to the Intercontinental playoff, it all happens in June. And in the first match day, the Iraqi national team, which is always sneaky good, got a goal. 53rd minute, they beat the United Arab Emirates, and so they are right there. They're a point off the UAE, and the UAE has to go play South Korea, and Iraq has to play Syria, who is in last place. But the warning signs were there, because Lebanon, if they won both matches, had a shot to get to the Asian playoff, but they lost to Syria 3 to nothing, which meant the Syrians were here to play in the last set of matches. And on match day 10, we saw that, because Iraq needed to win, and they needed the UAE not to win. Well, guess what? The United Arab Emirates won, and Iraq did not win. And so all the drama that was there on the last day fell apart. Because the UAE went and beat South Korea. The goal from Harib Abdallah Sohil, a 19-year-old from Shahab Al-Ali Dubai. So a nice young player scoring an incredibly important goal in the second half against South Korea. What's really inexplicable here is Iraq not being able to win the game against Syria. Al-Dali scored in the third minute for the Syrians. Iraq scored in the 31st, made a bunch of changes. They used all five subs in the second half, and they, they could not find another goal, and they did not get a goal from South Korea, which meant the United Arab Emirates, after losing to Iraq and looking like they were just going to slip right out of that playoff position. Gets a win over World Cup bound South Korea and now plays Australia in June. One match. It's one match in Qatar. It's essentially a home match for the UAE. Do not count them out to beat Australia. If they win that, which, uh, look, honestly, Australia is still the favorite. The Socceroos are still the better team, you have to say. They are former Asian champions. Then you play against the fifth place team from South America, which we'll figure out momentarily. But now before we get to the most important results, Oceania finished its qualifying. We'll get through very quickly. The Solomon Islands beat Papua New Guinea in the semifinals. You have to win the whole of Oceania, which is basically New Zealand and all the islands in the Pacific. They can't go into Asia because the travel to Lebanon to play an away day would be too far. Well, Solomon Islands beat Papua New Guinea, and we got a great showing from my boy, Rafael Leai. He scored a goal, the Solomon Islands wonder kid, as we call him, the Solomon Essie. And New Zealand played against a Tahitian team that honestly held them pretty tight. It was 1-0, 2-0. New Zealand, the only unbeaten team from the 2010 World Cup. The goal came from the New Zealand wonder kid Liberato Kakase from Impoli. He is a wonderful left-sided player, and he was able to grab the winning goal in the 71st minute. That's not comfortable. The final, though, New Zealand absolutely flexed its muscle. Solomon Islands, I'm over here hyping up Rafael Leai. Well, Tui Loma scores a goal early. Chris Wood scores a goal. It's 2-0 at halftime. Some guy I went to college with at the University of Virginia named Joe Bell scores for New Zealand. Don't worry, he plays professionally. He's not just some dude. But I did go to school with him for two years and broadcasted his games. Just a random fact. Toiloma scored again, and then Garbutt put the icing on it in the 91st minute to send New Zealand to the playoff against Costa Rica. So that set up Costa Rica's opponent 
they were undoubtedly rooting for the Solomon Islands because New Zealand Costa Rica will be a legit game. But that's New Zealand. They've been drawn in next to Costa Rica in the World Cup draw. South America came in with a whole host of possibilities because we had three teams that were essentially in. Brazil and Argentina mathematically in. Ecuador needed literally everything to go wrong. Actually everything to go wrong to not make the World Cup. And that was shown by the fact that they lost to Paraguay in clinch qualification in match day 17. Nice win for Paraguay. But the teams involved were Chile, Colombia, Peru, and Uruguay. And there was a huge six pointer on match day 17. Uruguay and Peru. This an Uruguayan team that had struggled. It's serious points during this qualification, they got the win. Monster win against the Peruvians. The winning goal was the 42nd minute from Georgian Dadasqueta, and Uruguay clinched qualification with that win. They ended up on 25 points. After those three, Peru was on 21. Colombia did get the win against Bolivia that they absolutely needed to put them on 20 points and right behind Peru, a good 3-0 win against the Bolivians, a Bolivian team that at one point held out some hope. Chile was playing Brazil, and if they managed to draw or win, they would have been more in the conversation, but Brazil knocked them around 4 to nothing, so Chile was up against it. But as you might have figured out based off the math, I, I tweeted out a very convoluted way that all three teams could get in or how all each of the three teams could get in or however the heck you're supposed to word that sentence. But all of them were not if Peru won on the final day because Peru was ahead of Colombia and Chile on points and Peru was playing Paraguay. And so the Peruvian national team went out and scored two goals and just completely took care of business. Colombia survived Venezuela on the road and did win. And if Peru had not won, that would have put Colombia into the playoff because that was basically all that was left after Uruguay won and Uruguay's into the fourth like automatic qualifying spot. And then Chile played against Uruguay. Chile had to win or it had no chance. And Chile went and lost two to nothing to Uruguay. So that means Chile is officially completely out of its golden generation that won two Copa Americas and got to a World Cup knockout stage. Uh, it is rebuilding time under Ben Brereton Diaz. Colombia also is going to be left to reevaluate things because it is insane to look at how bad Colombia was down the stretch they they lost so many massive matches you see a draw in their last five matches alone they lost to peru they drew paraguay who was not in the conversation coming down the stretch and any points in those matches would make all the difference in the world when you miss the world cup playoff by one point and peru who only won seven of their 18 matches timed those wins pretty well they won three of their last five matches that they played and fired themselves into a world cup playoff where they will take on the winner of uae in australia the final world cup qualification was beautiful drama it was in europe and europe set up this world cup qualifying playoff that we had basically never seen before it was three groups of four teams and they basically played a bracket 14 bracket and you win your first match you play again and then if you win that match you're in no home and away no nothing just over one week you're good the match between ukraine and scotland is suspended until june for obvious reasons but the other side of that bracket did play wales beat austria two to one gareth bale puts on a wales shirt and becomes actually one of the five best players on the planet again it's insane scores two great goals including a nuts free kick puts Wales through over Austria, one of the two teams that qualified due to their Nations League contributions. They did not actually finish second in World Cup qualifying. The other intricacy here is Russia's been banned from the international competition. They appealed, the appeal didn't go through for obvious reasons. And so Poland got a walkthrough, played the winner of Sweden and Czechia. And after 120 minutes, Sweden found a goal. Well, actually they found it in the 110th minute. It was Quezon the forward for Sweden that found the back of the net in 110th. Sweden showing a real ability to control a game, but struggling to score, something that may or may not come back to haunt them later in this video. The other group was, of course, the Italy-Portugal group, where we would get to watch the Italians and the Portuguese play for a World Cup spot, which was just going to be tremendously interesting. And then North Macedonia just completely messed all of that up by winning in Rome. World Cup on the line, and North Macedonia scores a fantastic goal with a few minutes to go and Italy didn't score and that was it now some of the Italian players were frustrated that it was just one match and one kind of crazy banger of a goal that ends up knocking them out of the World Cup well I have two points to counter that one you probably should have scored you're playing North Macedonia and two you did play a bunch of qualifying matches and you didn't win your group you actually finished behind Switzerland all you needed to do was beat North Ireland at home and you would be going to the World Cup right now or you know maybe beat Switzerland neither of those things 
happened, and that's why the Swiss were at the World Cup and why you had to play North Macedonia a game that you did eventually lose. So I don't really want to hear it. I do feel bad for the Italians. I know this feeling. I know what it feels like to not make the World Cup. It happened to you know, us and a similarly embarrassing fashion we lost to trinidad and tobago and uh i do sympathize with that but i also you know saying that it was unfair is also wrong portugal handled its business against turkey not nearly as comfortably as you would assume based off the 3-1 final score though portugal did take a 2-0 lead in the first half otavio diogo jota they're feeling good but burak ilmaz scored in the 65th minute and then in the 85th minute something spectacular happened Turkey got a penalty, and taking that penalty was the ageless wonder Burak Yilmaz, a player that you would always assume was going to score that penalty, except he didn't. He missed, and I still feel bad for him now because what a comeback that was for Turkey, and they're very hard on their national team. Portugal scored in the 94th minute to ice the cake as Turkey was throwing everybody forward, but it was a near-run thing. Also, I can't go through this video without mentioning the name. Tchaikovsky was the guy that scored for North Macedonia. Congratulations. Wales would have to wait until the June qualifying window to play their final match to try and make the World Cup, but Poland did get to play Sweden. They got to play them in Poland and they did win. Lewandowski scored a penalty and then just a terrible mistake out of the back gave Poland its second goal. Robin Olsen made some big saves or it could have been worse for Sweden. Even though Sweden controlled the first half, that was it. They, they, they couldn't create chances. They brought on Zlatan with like 10 minutes to go, but what's he gonna do then? And Portugal trying to avoid the fate of Italy did manage to beat the upstart North Macedonian side two to nothing to exhale and make the World Cup. That gave us these World Cup groups. We actually watched the World Cup draw live on stream. If you wanna be a part of stuff like that in the future, the link to the Twitch is down in the description. And if you wanna learn more about the World Cup groups, which ones are hard, which ones are easy, what the path looks like, we've got this video. This video breaks down uh, how hard each group is and actually ranks them. So enjoy, I'll see you on stream.